What you're about to witness is one of the most sinister sounding intros to a trailer to one of the greatest epics ever produced. And there's more. Because you are going to see it as well. Yes, it. Yes, it. So, uh, you, you, people know my background from uh, yesterday's speech that I, my real specialty is artificial intelligence and robotics and um, redefining what human beings will be in the future. And a lot of people find this scary. I don't want to be redefined. I, I don't like this idea, something that's beyond my control, the very sense of self uh, is going to be altered. Well, you're actually under a lot of control systems, and you have been since birth. Indoctrination, how did you learn to speak the language that you speak? Uh, how do you, what's etiquette? How do you know how to behave in, in society and in, in culture? So you've been indoctrinated. There are a whole bunch of forces that are controlling you and manipulating you at any time. So there's this field called cybernetics, and I'm going to define it as uh, Wikipedia defines it, but it's uh, a notion that we are not separated from machines. We are actually systems. And so it's, it's a concept that we are all part of an economic system, we are part of a tribe, part of a culture, and that even bionics or other uh, human augmentation, that was my speech yesterday, is still part of us. Um, so let me define cybernetics for you. Um, so the, the man who actually defined the word, created it in 1943, was a guy by Norbert Wiener. Uh, same time the CIA was created, by the way. But uh, The science of control and communication in the animal and the machine. Now, there are many definitions of cybernetics. Uh, I think I, I read about 71 of them before, before uh, creating this presentation. Um, and many individuals who have influenced the definition of direction of cybernetics. So the, the man, Norbert Wiener, a mathematician, engineer, social philosopher, coined this word uh, from the Greek, which means steersman or governance. Uh, he defined it as the science of control and communication in the animal. Um, he, uh, uh, in the machine, uh, Ampere before him wanted cybernetics to be the science of government. For philosophers, uh, cybernetics was an experimental uh, concern with the communication within an observer and between the observer and his environment. And there have been several other people that have uh, tried to uh, uh, precisely define this word cybernetics, but it's a very uh, difficult abstraction. And I, I studied under uh, Noam Chomsky for linguistics at MIT. He's, a, he's kind of a political activist, but he's a brilliant linguist, linguistic teacher. And I studied for artificial intelligence to trans have computers translate natural language processing. Um, and this is all related. Uh, cybernetics treats not things, but waves of behaving. So it's all about behavior within the system. Okay, with that, I'm going to go on. There was an interesting article that uh, came out just recently in Given my roots, this isn't actually all that new, but what's fascinating is the civilian scientists are catching up with some of the military work. Um, so this article came out, oh, about a week ago, and they're, they're literally connecting brains of other species. Now, how do, how do they prove that this is actually occurring? Uh, they look at the entrainment. So one, so they have a problem. Uh, let's say it's a bunch of uh, rat brains, three of them, all cybernetically linked. Uh, they can read the EEG patterns and see that they're solving the same problem. And as well as one rat, if he has a special experience, will transfer that into the next brain, into the next brain. 
So it's a type of indoctrination, just like with us human beings. Uh, you, you know, I mean, this, this is great for you have children. You want them to think the same way you do and, and <laughs> rush to that experience. But we use spankings and lollipops and, and verbiage, basically, to control children. Um, so what I study that I just find absolutely fascinating, and this is what is happening, uh, and the last speakers can probably confirm that. It's uh, the government is working on what's called cybernetic hive minds. And this technology is actually quite old. It's been around since the 60s. But it has many positive uses. And I <clears throat> promised myself when I started writing these presentations that I would take a positive spin <laughs> to everything because there's a very dark side to all of this and, and you know, a warning to humanity. Do we really want to go down this path? Um, some of the uses are increased intelligence. Well, you know, everybody wants a little edge. You know, you drink coffee, so you're awake. Uh, what is there was a way to put in a microchip, which MIT's already done, to uh, help uh, people that have their short-term memory damaged in some sort of way, either the aging process, car accident, and whatnot. And it, the neurons actually grow to the chip, and it replaces short-term memory. They can do this in mice, where one mouse learns a skill uh, running through a maze, place that microchip in another a mouse or rat's brain, and it has some memories of how to solve the maze faster than a rat that wouldn't have had the microchip. So now we're talking about instinct. You know, we're born as babies, yet we know how to uh, suckle from uh, a breast. No one taught the, us, the baby, how to do that. Um, and you know, the birds, they know how to build bird's nests or bees can create hives. No one taught them. This isn't taught from generation to generation. So the, the thing about humans is our intelligent capacity to learn, uh, to reason, and to use logic. And if you're in an economic society like we are, it's, it's not a social society, um, having uh, increased intelligence for your child to get into a better college or to get a better job, you're going to pay for that. You want your children to be um, more productive or successful, again, these are just definitions, whatever that means, um, than you are, and so you're probably going to want this. Well, with cybernetic hive minds, it's literally using the computing power of multiple people or other animals. Uh, I remember reading one report uh, by the Army that they, it's kind of a dark story, but they connected an ape's brain with a young girl's brain in a cybernetic, just two per uh, animal hive mind, and they thought the, the uh, ape would recognize itself through multiple eyes and et cetera. It's not what happened. The ape ended up killing the girl, but they've been running these experiments uh, for a long time. Um, what are some other positive benefits? Well, they call it the bluing effect in telecommunications, where the frequency, the wavelength of light going through the fiber optic cables becomes bluer rather than red, which is a lower frequency, so you can carry more information. Well, you know, we used to have snail mail, now we have email and phones and you know we're communicating with the speed of light and where the world's becoming smaller um, but this is even more rapid this is the next generation that you can communicate at the speed of thought now there are a lot of repercussions uh, for that and uh, we'll get into that um, in these cybernetic hive minds right now about only four people to six people can be hooked up. Uh, and they're, they're useful for things like brainstorming, sort of like a conference and communicating, but it's happening more rapidly. Now, if you have more than that, 
the uh, brains become schizophrenic and the thoughts overlap too much and they can't focus on whatever the problem is that they're trying to solve. Now, of course, the military and CIA and you know, your MI5, MI6, they like this because it's a great interrogation tool. Imagine you can't keep any secrets. You can't keep them from yourself. Um, so th what they're working on is not just the interrogation part of uh, probing the mind, um, what you can do even in the dream state when you have no defenses. Um, they, they, uh, they want to see if they can uh, insert thoughts into the human being. So another dark topic, mind control. And you, I'm sure you, you know, there have been other speakers that talk about this. But this is a problem. Um, we all love our privacy. We all love uh, our f sense of free will. And I, I do strongly say it's just a sense of un autonomy. You're always, unless you're in a sensory deprivation chamber, you are always getting other influences that your mind is reacting to. Um, they also uh, use it for sampling the population, for predictions of mass influence. So uh, what if we say this on television as, you know, as a, a policymaker in your government, how would the population respond? What other words can we use? And so it's a, a way of testing and polling the population without them even being aware that that's happening. But my favorite is accelerated education. Um, you know, I spent so many years in school and uh, probably a third of my life. Imagine that you can uh, pay for a system that clones your professor's ideas and thoughts quickly, uh, eliminating all the errors of thoughts and, and et cetera. I mean, that, that's a huge boost to the economy because we spend so much money on education. Um, but is that mind control? You gotta ask yourself, is education mind control? It, it's a way to teach people how to think. Is it mind control? And these are ethics and morals that you're gonna have to determine for yourself. Um, so I was talking a little bit uh, about, um, well, mind control in particular, and something that I worked on, uh, and I'm not proud of, but uh, it's called the voice of God weapon. So there are four different techniques and technologies that can pipe voices into an individual's head. And once you can do that, you can control them using neuro-linguistic programming techniques. Um, you're rewiring their thought processes and brains. Um, and so this gets into what's called offensive information warfare. And they used it, I believe, in the Gulf War uh, to tell the enemy at that time, lay down your guns, this is Allah. And it worked pretty well, because hearing voices which have no direction or sound, you have to assume that it's some spiritual entity. Uh, so it works pretty well. And uh, <clears throat> then, I don't know if I'm going to get into this, but there's something called hyper game theory. How do you, they, they want to see if they can manipulate people to do things that are irrational, but also walk them to their death. And so you can call it a eugenics program even. Um, and they need to f sample all cultures, language, uh, throughout the world to define their probability matrices of which tricks, techniques, deception works. Um, that's just what's happening. All right, well, let's talk a little bit more about the definition of intelligence. And, you know, I've argued this and debated this since I was young. Um, and I really couldn't come up with any good definitions. 
I, I like to think it's some form of self-awareness or reasoning, logic, and memory that's kind of more standard IQ tests. Maybe it's a capacity for empathy, because I know a lot of people that can't empathize. It means you don't have enough life experience to put yourself in that person's shoes. But artificial intelligence uses a stricter test, uh, slightly stricter. It, uh, they determine if it is truly self-aware, if they can fool a human being for an hour talking to an artificial intelligence uh, program. And so that, that test has stood up for a long time. They're way past that now, but you won't hear about that in the regular news. Um, so really what I think is amazing, and I'm, I'm gonna put a positive spin on this, is we're starting to mix and reconfigure minds as partially human and partially AI. And those are the experiments that are being tested on some of the public. Uh, they're often called emergent minds. And they're completely alien to this planet. Uh, planet's never seen this before, but we're creating them. It's sort of like genetic engineering. We're mixing genes up. New species are gonna arise from that. How do you define it? How do you classify it? Uh, so when thinking about intelligence, I, I started thinking about the SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Um, and that is like breaking encryption. So I, I look at it from the military point of view, signal intelligence. How do you know some source out in the universe that you're scanning is intelligent? Maybe it's a quasar star, maybe. And so you have to just say it's an abnormal signal. Let's try to decipher it. So it's really like encryption. Uh, and that's what intelligence is, is a complicated signal. All right, so let's get into how, how do you do this? How do you do this between human beings? Now, there's the age-old way of hooking a human being up to uh, uh, many probes, uh, it's called EEG, electroencephalograph, and reading and deciphering the brain waves as they, they are created w within the scalp. Um, uh, it's just an electromagnetic field. You can also do it with infrared. Um, and th there, there are a lot of neat inventions that have come with this. I mean, I, I made one invention that you can create music with your mind, with your thoughts alone. It was only eight octave scale. Uh, you can move robots. Once you train your brain with robot, you can move robots. So they have video games up now. You can play video games with thought processes alone that use this basic technology. Things have come a long way. And now we have... Uh, which are magnetically activated nanoparticles and sensors. So how do you control a brain? Most people don't believe that. Oh, you can't control me. I, I have my own free will. There's no way you can get to my soul. Well, sorry, that's not true. Um, so these nanoparticles are activated under certain magnetic frequency and will alter the brain patterns and pathways. Uh, Recently, my school came out, Harvard came out with uh, what you see here on the right slide is the magnified view of a needle that's injected into the brain and puts the scaffolding over the brain and then it's read that way at a f much finer resolution. Somebody yesterday, I don't know if you, you still hear some gentleman Ask me about smart dust, and I said I would talk about that a little bit. Um, or, I'm sorry, neural dust. Um, he asked me a question before I get into the slide. He hypothesized that mad cow disease was caused by neural dust experimentation. Now, my answer would be um, that agrees with most scientists. Neural dust is non-replicating. 
So it can't infect one cow or the other. I mean, they would all have to be injected if it were an experiment. And uh, what really caused mad cow disease was something called prions, which is a protein that is self-replicating, form of encephalitis. And it's very rare that that disease is contagious amongst species. This version of it, mad cow disease, uh, happened to be contagious to humans. Um, so smart dust is something different, and it's fairly new, you know, last 15 years. Um, and you can inject a person, and it's just really tiny microcircuits that act as transmitters all over your neurons, and they settle there, and then you can read them remotely. Um, what would happen? Well, it probably would create something like mad cow disease, I imagine, but um, it's a way to read brains. It's one of the many techniques. Um, so let's talk about a little bit um, um, about deciphering the audio and visual cortex. Uh, so researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, have invented a brain decoder device that's able to work out what you're thinking based on neural activity inside of the brain. Now, they use mostly what's called functional MRIs. Um, but uh, you could use any of these technologies I've talked about. If you're reading text in a newspaper or book, you hear a voice in your own head. Usually, most people are reading kind of aloud in their own head. Well, they can read that, decipher the words that you were thinking to yourself. Um, and similarly, several other universities have uh, been working on dreams. Now, now imagine being able to uh, share a dream with your partner or, you know, an interactive dream or record a dream or replay it to another human of some other life experience or dreams. Uh, you know, that's the wonderful vision of the technology. The downside is what I talked about earlier. You can be programmed in your dreams. Many cultures, like the Indians, believe that dreams are spiritual. God is talking to them, and hence it's a good mind control tactic. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's the time of our, hopefully, our private, creative, subconscious processes is going on. Um, so there's uh, another one, uh, University of LA, maybe Stanford University. They are decoding visual images. So they train the person under a functional MRI, that's the standard technique, to look at images and then they record them and then they ask the person to uh, imagine the object. It can also just be imaginary and the computer will decipher the brain code, and so you're looking at a hammer, you're looking at a saw, that's a house, that's a cat. So the technology in the civilian sector is coming along uh, quite quick, quickly. Now, so the, there is a warning about artificial intelligence. Uh, Bill Gates recently came out and said, you know, we don't know what we're doing. This might be the end of the human race. Elon Musk of Te Tesla, a uh, billionaire, said the same thing. We gotta stop this. In fact, he invested $10 million uh, for a research grant to figure out what the safety controls are in artificial intelligence. Uh, Stephen Hawking, one of your professors, has said this. Um, so a lot of smart people are saying, we gotta look at the future. Th this may not be the best solution uh, we have control of it now, but if uh, something like Skynet uh, from the Terminator movies comes online, we, we have uh, morality, it does not seem to be a part of intelligence. And so let, let me give you uh, an example, read this. Um, human, so this is the human being, and this is out of Google, by the way, says, tell me the definition of morality. 
The machine, the AI program, says, I don't have ethics. Human, look, I need help. I need to know more about morality. I don't know what ethics is. Okay, I need to know how I should behave morally. I don't know how to tell you. Is morality and ethics the same? Yes, sir. What are the things that I do to be immoral? I don't know. Give me some examples of moral actions. I'm not a moralist. All right, morality, integrity. What is integrity? I'm sorry, I don't know what else to say. Be moral. <laughs> the, the, the AI program says, be a man. <laughs> I really like our decision on morality and ethics. And the machine says, and how I'm not in the mood for a philosophical debate. What, what do you want to talk about? Nothing. So he totally shuts down his master, his rock cover. I thought that was brilliant. Um, let's see. Okay, and I, I'm going to get a little bit off topic here. I'm coming sort of to the end of my presentation, so hold on there. But, um, and I'll show you how this is a little relevant. Uh, there's a technology that, um, uh, it, this is out of Japan, this is a company that's doing a three-dimensional television which you can touch. So I, I was going to show you a, a short clip or movie, uh, but I, I can get it on my presentation. But this is a finger touching a, a, a femtometer, that's 1 times 10 to the minus 15, uh, guided lasers that when they intersect they create this these glowing dots and they they can make it into all sorts of shapes and so and the reason I bring this up is because this technology has been around far longer than again civilians know about and it's a way that the Air Force is creating orbs in the sky many orbs through intersection of these high-powered lasers. Now, you can't see the lasers because they're out of our uh, visual range, but where they intersect, they'll create a glowing ball. Now, that's great for Air Force because uh, you're ionizing the air, and that creates a radar deflection. So, you can, for your enemy, you can make it look like entire fleets are about to approach and bomb and whatnot, it's all an illusion. It's all an illusion. Um, so, but this is a cool technology that's coming about. So you can imagine combining some of these technologies. Now, let's say you're reading someone's dream. Well, you can touch it and change it in three dimensions. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of possibility, a lot of potentials there. I worked on uh, eye tracking, eye gaze interfaces uh, for the military, the DOD. And, uh, wherever you looked, it's looking at your pupil and reflection of infrared light, you would, your mouse cursor will move. And then when you're on whatever menu item you want to do, you blink and if, slowly. And then you drag it down and then you blink twice, just like you do in a mouse click. Um, and that's an operating system that's completely you know, hands off. I mean, you can, there was also a voice recognition system built into it too. Um, but what's interesting, if we can connect the visual workspace, and that's what psychologists call it, when you imagine things, you daydream, they call it the visual workspace. Also, with compu computer feedback into the mind, imagine the possibilities, imagine them. Um, so I'm going to close up here, and this is very controversial. I uh, know. <laughs> uh, so Revelations 18.23, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And, you know, there, there's some, something similar to that by Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology appears like magic to a lesser civilization. And where I'm getting with this is uh, Reagan had a speech at the United Nations, and he, he made it at least three times. And he said, if aliens were attacking us, if 
we, we would uh, we'd give up our differences and we'd fight the aliens. And he was just trying to make a point. Maybe a new world order is something we need to think about. Maybe we shouldn't have these wars. You know, it's an interesting way to put it. But, but that's how we tribe, is usually governments create fear, terrorism, whatever it may be, and then we all got to stick together. Um, and that gets into, you know, false flags. And so Project Blue Beam, which is just rumor, this is true conspiracy theory here, although I know it's possible, um, that uh, somebody apparently from NASA leak this as something they were working on. And telepathy, electronic two-way communications. Well, we have that now. And that's very scary if you don't, if you've never experienced it. Um, making hum humanity think an alien invasion is about to occur at every major city. Well, we have holograms in the sky. I describe that technology. Um, and, you know, they, they talk about other things uh, that might make this come about. But all I am saying is beware. Um, so, for example, I'm going to say something controversial. Uh, I love crop circles. I think they're just beautiful art. Um, and the effort to make them is incredible. But I happen to have known a few gents back in America that were engineers and artists, and they built a machine that was all automated, GPS run, they would do the design, and they built a 10-mile crop circle in Nevada. You could only see from airplanes or satellites. And it was gorgeous, it was gorgeous. But I was impressed by the engineering. I don't know if they're real or not. Um, but, uh, so I, you know, I, I love mystery and wonder. And all that gives us, I think, as humans, we want hope. We want to think we're not alone. Uh, somebody will save us from ourselves. And, um, so kind of in closing, is this the end of humanity or a beginning of a new species? Many believe that transhumanism will be the end of the human race. Um, I kind of you know, disagree with that. Perhaps it's just the redefinition of what the human race is. What if we are the mothers and fathers of a better species than our own? Perhaps we can amplify love and happiness, end all wars. Perhaps the new world will be more perfect than what we have now. I don't think we should be scared. We should embrace the future and understand the consequences. Questions? The mad cow disease, because of... Oh, okay, that was you, yes. Disease. Sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know how far you are into the research of the disease itself. You know more than I do. Okay. Yeah. If, if it's okay for you, I will just fit in the facts, because the transmi transmitting agent was crystalline. They burned it at 800 degrees, injected it into the brain of the next animal, and it still transmitted the disease. So what is transmitting is the barium strons in the piezo crystal. Itself. Not necessarily. Now, remember, a prion is a protein. It's not a virus. It's not a bacteria. Yeah, it's it's, it's a protein that self-replicates, and it's immune to high temperatures. So you can't cook the meat, uh, and that won't get rid of it. It's, no. uh, the prion goes away at 800 degrees. Only the crystalline, okay. right. 800, yeah. 800. That sounds this about right. Yeah. And, and they managed to transmit it at 800 degrees, introducing the ash of the brain of an infected animal into a healthy animal. This but, is one part. Okay. The, the protein prion chain uh, appears when the nervous system is dissolved because the mercury is stri stripping the nerve and the, the lack of copper is dissolving the nerve. So basically this is dissolved nervous tissue that recombines with other heavy metals that are available okay. to rebuild an artificial... What network. made you think it was smart dust or... 
it, it, just from, from the geometry, if you have a, a new core, like a piezo crystal forming the center of a new neuronal... Uh, well, it causes the holes and then, in the brain. And then you, then mm -hmm. the, the nervous system regrows. Instead of copper prion uh, protein, it goes barium prion protein chain. And this connects to the piezo crystal. So we have an antenna system that is spitting out electro electrons on command by radio signals and introducing the electric signal into the animal own nervous system. So this is exactly the concept when you go into, into YouTube and you look for uh, um, concepts of self-assembling nanobots. So, so what's the cover up? Why are they covering that research? Um, I, I don't know what, what, what they, they try to do. I guess it was an experimentation how far the system affects the health. Because what they did is they had a, a, a mandatory vaccination with a, with a chelat that pulled out the copper of all the cows. And this is where the disease started. The lack of copper started the dissembling of the nervous system. And having a completely senseless mandatory vaccination causing this uh, pandemia of mad cow disease looks like experimentation to me. Huh. Sorry, it's, it's just the setting looks like. I don't have internal information who did it. And the piezo crystals come via the chemtrails. It's the main compound of chemtrailing is uh, uh, um, the, the barium strontium titanate. Wouldn't that affect uh, humans as well? Uh, the, the mad cow disease is uh, Kreutzfeld-Jakob in the human fields, and the other old age disease. Alzheimer's. They don't take on barium and strontium, they take on uh, lead, that it's a ALS, so they take on aluminum, then you have Alzheimer and dementia. So basically all the old age disease look like a side effect of this uh, dust used as uh, new, new Interesting dust theory. In the, yeah. It's all in the papers. You, you can, you can ex the, the biochemistry is fitting 100%. All right, and I'll research that for that. developed on top of this is working 100%. So I guess there must be something to it. The only thing we don't have is if anybody in the, let's say, civil domain research is aware of what is happening over there. And I would really like to connect to those people. If you have connection into the research, do us all a favor. All right, good comment. Okay, thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Lady over here. I, I was just wondering if you could um, speak more on the allowing supernatural forces going through the fiber optics and the coast cables. The what I said about bluing through the fiber optic cables. Um, I just saw on um, the screen, it's, you said something about allowing a mixture of supernatural forces to, that could come through the fiber optic cables. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure if I said that exactly. Oh, I think there was something in the, I think it was the last um, slide maybe, it said something mm -hmm. like that. Um, yeah, the last point right there. Oh, oh yeah, there it is. Um, Just wondering if you could maybe elaborate. No, but see, this is supposed to be deception. Uh, this is a project to make people believe that supernatural forces are going through their television or through the cables. So, yeah, there's no science behind it. Thank you. John Lowy. Yeah, can you elaborate on hyper game theory and so-called walking people to their death? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so hypergame theory came out of a, a professor at Dartmouth, obviously, funded by the Air Force and DARPA and et cetera, all the, all the acronyms. And um, it came from a man that died recently, a brilliant man named John Nash, um, who there was a movie made about him called The Beautiful Mind. And he was a mathematician who won a Nobel Prize. And he created game theory, which is used in economics, as well as uh, war theory. Now, it relies on rational players. So you run these simulations. What will China do if we make this move? What is the, the, theory, the game 
the, the war game going on, or you can use it in business, similar, uh, similar process. Hyper game theory is a, a one level above of, a, of that abstraction that you don't know what game they're going to play. So they use it in cyber warfare, uh, mostly. And attackers, you know, hackers, they'll use several different techniques. But the defenses, the administrator, and the virus protectors, protection, they don't know what game these hackers are using. So they create a probability matrix over the period of the time of sampling all the different kinds of hacks they get. Now you can apply this to other aspects of life. The way that I was using it is they're trying to, it was called mind hacking. So they're trying to hack a targeted individual and you know the target individual will create mental defenses as best as they can. They'll go to their social networks. Trade, well, what do they do? They try to disrupt the social network so you have no family or friends. They, and it's a, a back and forth game that uh, they're trying to find out the maximum probability of death in the example that you use where you'll commit suicide or, or you're, you'll harm somebody, become a Manchurian candidate or something like that. So it's huge, huge database of probabilities across all the variations of mind. You know, the, the human genome, I think we have, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, so I'm not even going to say it, but a finite in the hundreds of thousands of different genes across our species. Um, and we mapped them out in the Human Gene Project. Well, now it's the Human Mind Project, the Global Brain Project. You know, uh, uh, President Obama just recently funded uh, a whole bunch of scientists to decipher the mind. Well, our previous president, same thing, George Bush, said the same thing. They're trying to decipher every possible thought and uniqueness due to culture and language and, and whatnot. Thank you. Another one, please. So, he's gonna, Matthew, just can have a reply from this gentleman. Yeah. Um, it, well, if there's no accountability or transparency in the development of all of this, how is it possible to have a positive outlook on this topic and humanity? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a typical question. Um, I guess keep pressuring your government for transparency. Uh, but scientists, some of the scientists, and uh, while we may have our personal ethics and our, our personal beliefs and be moral people as an individual, we don't think of science as evil. We're, we're brainwashed into believing everything we're doing is for the benefit of mankind. But look who pays our bills. It's all military, it's all for war, it's all for control, government control. Um, so yes, you should be dubious. I don't think you should be depressed because there are a lot of great possibilities out there, especially if there's a technology transfer from the military to the civilian sectors. We'll, we'll see a lot of uh, uh, businesses that uh, will feed our desires and needs. Um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer, but yeah, it's, it's scary. Um, I've got a quick question. Uh, just uh, to confirm, you said you, you were a little bit embarrassed, ashamed that you'd worked on a project called The Voice of God. Yeah. And to your understanding, it had been used in the Iraq War, but you worked on it. Can you tell us what the name of the project in the military as it was being developed was and how much was spent on it? Oh, no. I, I wasn't interested in budgets right. or, or names, the name but the, the, the nickname was Voice of God. Um, but it goes under a lot of different names, uh, different variations. And so let me talk about some of the technology. Um, it's called, the, one is called the microwave hearing effect, which uh, with directed microwaves, uh, this was discovered by a guy named Frey, uh, will and they're not totally sure what the mechanism is, but they hypothesize that the brain expands ever so slightly with this energy, heat energy, that gets conducted to the inner ear. 
Um, there are several other technologies that use ion cyclotron resonance heating or calcium C2 plus uh, as a mechanism of influencing the nervous system. And all the ions have their different resonances under the Earth's magnetic field. And, um, the, the, and then you can go into the uh, ultrasonic uh, realm where anybody in the beam with one of the ultrasonic ultrasound waves won't hear anything. It's above human hearing. But where the waves intersect from two different directional sources, all of a sudden that person hears it, and that's called the audio spotlight. So there are a lot of mechanisms to project voices into people's heads. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman over here. Um, Due to some unusual experiences in the past, I am interested in the phenomenon of uh, time. Now, what's the latest on time travel, uh, time anomalies research, uh, portals, uh, the elevator to uh, Mars, the so-called, and uh, stuff like this? Well, I don't know too much about time travel other than what Einstein uh, predicted is near very high gravitational fields, and this is general theory of relativity. So like near a black hole, you can shoot yourself into the future if you circle around it. But, um, and you know, we have that CERN super collider that's online. That's gonna create some interesting relativity effects. I don't know any instrument that can beam you back in time. That would be a paradox in the universe. Gentleman wants to reply here. Um, actually, I, I developed some kind of a theory which is more spiritual in that sense. Um, it is that we have been in the future, maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now, uh, at the extension level event facing this, and finally, um, having come back from the future, having come back from the future, and trying to change the present uh, right now, just living our own lives again. And uh, this isn't much about um, uh, physics, but it's also a spiritual thing um, and time travel uh, thing. Um, could you imagine that something like this is possible? Well, not with our current state of human technology, but um, could it be possible? Well, right now the greatest physicists say that we have an infinite number of parallel universes to our own, the one that we're experiencing. So it, that would be shifting from one universe to the other. Um, spiritually speaking, you know, the, I, I would say that your mind is very good at modeling the future and prediction. And you're coming back from that saying, this is what I need to do to change my life. That, that would be my guess. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this lady over here. Hello. Uh, how many implants do you think the average person has? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Uh, how many implants uh, the average person has? Not somebody who works uh, in the sickle service or whatever. Yeah, implants. Uh, because I, I, I had uh, mine taken out. Yeah, did that help you? Well, no, you just can do it. Uh, uh, on galactic connection, and they do it uh, spiritual. And most people they've got an uh, implant in the third eye, on, and uh, uh, okay, I, I, I can understand it as a spiritual experience. But once your brain has been mapped out, you're kind of in the system. Uh, you have unique resonance signature, body and, and brain. The the head, for example, resonates in most adults around 80 hertz. Uh, and the human body around 450 megahertz, 80 hertz, they say that, 80 megahertz. 
Um, but you have a unique signature, everything from your fingerprint to your, your unique brain patterns. So maybe once you've been implanted, you're in the system, you can be tracked anyway, and uh, taking the chips out won't really do any good. No, but it's a, it's a spiritual process, what they do. They take it out spiritually. Uh, haven't you heard of it? Oh, well, yes. I, I don't I know. It's from the organs. They put uh, implants in people. I have heard of it. I, I only know military and the experimentation they're doing on humans. Um, so I can't really respond to that question. Yeah, but how many do you think people have on average? I, well, for my research, I've interviewed about a thousand people and yeah, 900. Um, I estimate a minimum of 10,000. Now with one person, how many different, how many implants have they got? Oh, in a single person? Well, it depends. Are we talking about neural dust, as I spoke about? Which, you know, those are millions <laughs> and too tiny yes. for you to... <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you. It's a lady at the front here. Is that it? Uh, and this lady here. I'd like oh. to ask a question afterwards as well. Okay, sure. Right. Hello. Um, I have a question that relates to step three in Project, Project Bluebeam. Um, it concerns telepathic um, electronic two-way communication. Um, I wondered if it was possible for um, images um, to be directed into yes. the thoughts and the minds. Um, for a number of reasons, for myself and um, I've spoken to Yeah, in fact, all five senses can be mildly overrided depending on the state. Now, if you're in a sensory deprivation tank, your mind seeks stimulus, you know, hearing, sight, temperature, anything. Um, so if you're in that situation, your dreams become your reality. Your brain cannot tell the difference. But in other circumstances, if you stay well stimulated, um, it's difficult to project visual images into the target. But uh, even the university professors are working on this. Um, so yes, it's absolutely possible and is being done. And in fact, many people complain about uh, uh, forced dreams or, or something like that, that their dreams are not their own. And, you know, that can be, there are a whole bunch of subconscious ways that can be done as well as stimulating the visual cortex in the right patterns and try to project them into the target, yeah. So, um, who would be projecting these, sorry, who would be, which organization would be projecting these, uh, who's responsible? <laughs> you can't say. <laughs> Okay, um, but it just seems to be very real because I've heard it from more than one source, and it can be oh, quite it's quite real because yeah. you're awake; you're not asleep necessarily. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it projects also in the visual workspace, as I mentioned before. So it's like your third eye, and you can see both your, you know, through your retina, as well as this other projection at the same time. Your brain's been rewired, and it's inserting this third eye projection, if you will. Is there any way we can protect against this? No, no, great question. No. Mm -hmm. No, you can dampen the effects uh, through stimulating your senses, like music or uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and that seems to help. Uh, certain drugs can dampen the effects. Um, but uh, no one's found a little device that you can wear around that will block no, the signal. Hat you can wear no tinfoil hats. hats. No, they don't work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I reckon we've got time for about two more. Um, there's a lady up here who wants to ask one, and then I'd like to ask you a question at the end, if that's all right. Oh, sure. Sure. Here we go. <sighs> um, you were talking about forced dreams. I know of four people in 2012 that had um, dreams about Atlanta, two in the UK and two in, in Florida, who kept having dreams about Atlanta, and two ended up moving there and one ended up going for a few months. And it's, it's strange how we all kind of found each other there in Atlanta. But um, 
I was telling a friend of mine this before, and she said that ages ago an ex-FBI agent told her that there was a really large underground base in Atlanta where they're doing human experiments, and I know it sounds mad, but have you ever heard anything? Not in Atlanta, but they are everywhere. I mean, I've, I've heard the rumors. I've been to a couple of secret bases in your countries, but uh, no, I didn't find any human experimentation going on. Uh, but, but one of the things we were talking about, uh, mind control and manipulation, uh, part of the research they're doing is to see if they can manipulate people to run into other people, they call them information couriers. Mm -hmm. It's just part of a big game that the intelligence agencies are playing. Okay, I'll come down on the stage, actually. Because uh, I think it's probably going to be the last question. Now, uh, now, um, Dr. Duncan, you've given us a lot of reason over the last two days to be concerned by the potential for abuse of this technology. Um, at the end of your presentation today, you see you feel quite optimistic about the idea of transhumanism. I mean, maybe you're talking about you know, a perfect world where we can draw perfect circles or whatever. But in my view, um, how is this possible? How is it possible for transhumanism to be a good thing without some almost unimaginable social revolution? And I mean, um, as Max Egan, I don't know if you've seen Max Egan's video about transhumanism, he puts it very right, very succinctly, and he says, um, um, how, how, much, how much can we be transhumanized without losing our humanity, especially in where, where we have rulers who have none? No, I, and that's an excellent point, and that, that's why I try to ask more questions than I answer is, um, you, it has to be a social revolution. I mean, that's, that's the only way. It, it could be accepted by society, but this is so gradual within our generations that it will become more and more accept uh, acceptable. So people walking around with Bluetooth, you know, headsets, well, now we accept that. They look like the Borg, but, and so s slowly this will eventually be rolled in and we won't give it another thought. When a child is born, we genetically engineer them you know, with blue eyes or what, whatever they... <laughs> Some might argue, though, that yeah, the, the technology we already have, I mean, the technology we already have is sort of cutting us off from each other. I mean, I, I mean I'm guilty here myself. I, I, apart from my family in my hometown and the, the men I live with, I know one person. Uh, the, but I have thousands of friends online, so maybe... Yeah. So, so is that re just a redefinition of how to be social? Is, what, what is a friend on Facebook? You know, and how often you talk to them, I, you, you can't shake their hand, you can't hug them, I, you know, I, I don't know, this is something society is going to have to deal with, this is a social revolution, it's occurring right now at a very rapid rate, I call it a cosmic evolutionary event in mankind. Yeah, it could, and also, um, we, we, seeing as we do have a malevolent elite in this world, um, the potential for, uh, the, the potential danger here is enormous. It is, and I think there may be an agenda to depopulate the world. Oh, I think there is. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, sleep tight. <laughs> I know. But... <laughs> It's, it's grim stuff, I know, and it's... And it's it is grim it is, stuff. It is Leave stuff on a happy note. Look, look at this way. I mean, if people, if people are not talking about this, then it'll be an awful lot worse than the people are talking about it. I mean, that would really scare me if this was going on and people were not talking about it. So, um, so Dr. Rob... In the United States, copyright law allows for the fair use of copyrighted material under certain limited circumstances without the prior permission from the owner. Under the law, determinations of fair use taken into account purposes of fair use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the work use in relation to the work as a whole, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for the copyrighted work. Other jurisdictions may have similar copyright provisions protecting fair use or fair dealing. If you are uncertain as to whether a specific use qualifies as a fair use, you should consult a qualified copyright attorney. You have the right to take it down.